news tonight. Trump card. Donald Trump finds a loophole in tax evasion allegations against him. Hephaestus' rage. Wildfires ravaging through Greece reaches Athens. Jab intervention. The WHO discourages the third jab in wealthy countries. Equatorial snow. Latin Americans get a snowy surprise in the middle of the summer. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Other Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Suzanne Shainali. A very good evening and thank you for joining with us on World News Tonight. We start off today's coverage with a look into America's 45th president. Former President Donald Trump challenged in court last week's U.S. Justice Department order to turn his tax returns over to a House of Representatives committee, part from his long campaign to keep details of his wealth secret. Former President Donald Trump spent years trying to keep details of his wealth secret and on Wednesday took his fight to a federal court in an effort to block Congress from obtaining his tax returns. In a D.C. court filing, Trump's lawyers argued that the House Ways and Means Committee had no legitimate basis for seeking his federal tax records. The legal move comes after the U.S. Department of Justice last week ordered the Internal Revenue Service to hand the records over to congressional investigators. The DOJ order reverses course from the stance it took when Trump was in office. At the time, critics accused Trump of using the Justice Department to advance his personal and political interests during his four years in office. The department has since moved to reassert its independence. Trump was the first president in 40 years to not release his tax returns, despite a campaign promise to do so. The Democratic-led House committee has said it wants the tax data to determine whether the IRS is properly auditing presidential tax returns in general and to assess whether new legislation is needed. Trump's lawyers called that a pretextual rationalization. More than 500 firefighters struggled through the night of, to contain a large forest blaze on the outskirts of Athens, which raced into residential areas, forcing thousands to flee. It was the worst of 81 wildfires that broke out in Greece over the past 24 hours, amid one of the country's most intense heat waves in decades. A thick cloud of smoke surrounded one of the most famous landmarks of the ancient world on Wednesday, the Parthenon in the Greek capital of Athens. A wildfire tore through a forest on the city outskirts, leaving behind scorched earth and scores of gutted homes, businesses, and vehicles. The fire began Tuesday about 12 miles north of Athens, but firefighters managed to slightly subdue it by Wednesday morning. Nikos Hardalias, who works for the government's Civil Protection Bureau, told Athens residents to stay indoors to protect themselves from smoke pollution. Fires were also burning on the island of Evia and in the western Peloponnese, where villages were evacuated near the site of the first Olympic Games. Greece is facing its most severe heat wave in 30 years, with temperatures hitting nearly a high of 110 degrees. The heat and strong winds are fanning Greece's fires over the border into Turkey. To try to stop it, France and Sweden have sent their own firefighters. That reinforcement is expected to arrive on Thursday. We have some good news for you. Australia will create a $380 million reparation fund for members of its indigenous population who were forcibly removed from families months after 800 survivors filed a class action lawsuit. For more on this, let's cross over to other than a world news special correspondent, Himashi Pereira, who joins us now from Melbourne in Australia. Himashi? Yes, Shinali. Um, the program is uh, part of a new $1 billion boost uh, to close the gap between indigenous and non-indigenous Australians, basically. Uh, since Australia's colonization began somewhere uh, around 1788, um, thousands of indigenous families, uh, their children, were forcibly removed from their families by the government, churches, and also the welfare bodies. So they were instead raised in institutions or adopted by non-indigenous families and stripped off of their culture and the language. Um, more than 100,000 children were affected uh, and they are known to be uh, stolen generations. 
Uh, the removal of children devastated the community with lasting intergenerational trauma that is still felt today through broken family ties, uh, fragmented identity, and a large number of indigenous children in state care. Yeah, uh, back to you, Senali. All right, thank you. That was other than a World News Special Correspondent Himashi Perera reporting from Melbourne in Australia. Now for the updates on the Tokyo Olympics. A second day of extreme heat and looming threat of a summer storm didn't deter the Olympic golfing field from filling out some impressive scorecards in round two of the women's competition in Tokyo. The reigning women's PGA champion Nelly Koda lived up to her world number one ranking going to a tear that included a nine-hole stretch at eight under par. A resolute Indian men's hockey team rewrote history as it claimed an Olympic medal after 41 years, defeating a plucky German 5-4 to win the bronze in an edge-of-the-seat playoff match. Burkina Faso celebrated as triple jumper Hugh Fabrizanko won the first ever Olympic medal for the country on Independence Day. Let's take a look at the leaderboard of the close fights within the Olympic arena over at Olympics. China has taken a strong lead with 33 gold medals, 24 in silver, 16 in bronze and takes home 73 in total. Following closely along in the United States which despite coming in second by medal count has 86 in total, bringing in 27 golds, 34 silver and 25 bronze medals. In a surprising turnout, the big two have outnumbered other competing countries by far, with third place holder Japan bringing home only half of that of the states at a grand total of 43 medals, of which 21 are golds, 8 silvers and 14 bronze awards. Lebanon marked a year since a cataclysmic explosion ravaged Beirut with a mix of grief over lost lives and rage at the impunity for its worst peacetime disaster, which occurred at a time when the economy was already in tatters. While a memorial service took place at the port, thousands of protesters gathered in the city's centre de to demand accountability over the blast. One year after a deadly blast at Beirut's port killed over 200 people, protesters filled the streets of the Lebanese capital, demanding justice. Riot police fired tear gas on stone-throwing protesters who tried to storm parliament, resulting in several people being injured. Earlier in the day, thousands marched through Beirut, wielding photos of their lost loved ones. For their families, there are still no answers. At ground zero of the explosion, a ceremony was held to remember those killed by the blast. As the clock struck 6.07 p.m. local time, the exact time of the blast, thousands stood silently, looking over the ruins of the port's grain silos. The deafening silence echoing the perceived inaction of the country's political class, who have been accused of stalling an investigation into how the disaster happened. One year on, no senior official has been held accountable for the huge quantity of unsafely stored ammonium nitrate, and not a single culprit has yet been identified. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more World News. Welcome back. Now crossing over to the Middle East. There has been intense fighting in Afghanistan in recent days, mainly in the south and the west. While a bomb and gun attack in capital Kabul has killed at least eight people, several attacks have struck the capital city in the past 24 hours, including a car bomb explosion, but no group has claimed responsible. Roads turned to rubble and burnt out cars. This is the aftermath of an attack on the defence minister's house on Tuesday night. He and his family were safely evacuated, but several people were left dead or injured. And the coordinated assault caused widespread damage. The dust had barely settled on this street when Kabul was again rocked by a second explosion in as many days on Wednesday. These latest attacks come as the Taliban ratchets up their pressure on the government in the wake of the withdrawal of U.S. troops. The group has taken control over much of the countryside and some towns and are now targeting cities such as Kandahar and Herat. 
In the south, the city of Lashkargah is also under attack. Home to some 200,000 people, the army has called on civilians to flee to clear the way for a military offensive. The insurgents say they want peace, but their actions tell a different story. And these people in Kabul had had enough on Tuesday night. They took to the streets to express their support for the government, chanting Alu Akbar, God is the greatest. Calling for a halt on COVID-19 vaccine boosters until at least the end of September, WHO Chief Tedros Adhanom has stressed on the fact that wealthier nations are acting selfish with vaccines when poorer countries continue to suffer. The call for a momentorium comes as the gap between vaccinations in wealthier and poor countries widen. WHO is calling for a moratorium on boosters until at least the end of September to enable at least 10 percent of the population of every country to be vaccinated. The World Health Organization on Wednesday called for a pause in booster shots to the already fully vaccinated to focus on countries where supply is low, as the more infectious Delta variant threatens areas with low vaccination rates and strains healthcare systems. WHO Director General Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus on Wednesday called for an urgent reversal of vaccine distribution to meet the needs of poorer countries. I understand the concern of all governments to protect their people from the Delta variant. But we cannot and we should not accept countries that have already used most of the global supply of vaccines using even more of it. According to the WHO, low-income countries have only been able to administer 1.5 doses for every 100 people due to lack of supply, a number far lower than in high-income countries. It's a false choice. But White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki pushed back Wednesday, saying the U.S. is prepared to provide some Americans with booster shots, if approved by regulators, and can continue to donate vaccines. Uh, we announced just yesterday that we hit an important milestone of over 110 million vaccines donated to the world. So we've taken action on the global level uh, far more than any country around the world. We're asking the global community to also step up. We the United States in July signed a deal with Pfizer and BioNTech to buy 200 million additional doses of their COVID vaccine to help with pediatric vaccination as well as possible booster shots. With the fast-spreading Delta variant, some countries, like Israel, have already begun to administer booster shots to people over the age of 60, while others, like the U.S., are still debating whether they are, at this point, necessary. Health officials activated an emergency plans in France on the uh, Mediterranean island of Corsica as a fourth wave of COVID-19 infections spread across the country. The government also announced it was reactivating a package of measures designed to support medical staff as they brace for a fresh intake of cases. Faced with a growing number of COVID-19 cases, Corsica is ringing the alarm bells. The French island has seen infections rise drastically over the past weeks, leaving medical staff scrambling to free up intensive care beds. On Tuesday, Corsica introduced emergency measures to alleviate pressure on hospitals. These include deprogramming non-essential surgeries and medical interventions to make room for COVID-19 patients. The emergency plan was launched after the island's incidence rates rose from less than four to nearly 650 cases per 100,000 inhabitants in a month, a figure that far surpasses France's national average of 224. In the northern city of Bastia, hospital admissions have quadrupled in the past week, stretching resources to the limit. Corsica's emergency measures are set to remain in place for the next four weeks. Moving on to China, the Chinese government has tightened travel restrictions for its citizens as the country battles a rise in COVID-19 infections. Numerous cases have been reported in the eastern city of Nanjing. Mass testing is also underway in the Wuhan city, which was the epicenter when the pandemic broke out. This after the first reporters of local infections of the Delta variant. This is the entrance to a housing estate in China's northwestern district of Haidian. It was cordoned off after one resident was confirmed infected with COVID-19. In fact, the entire area of 230,000 square meters has been placed under lockdown, 
with residents barred from leaving. On top of that, strict cleaning and disinfection protocols have been implemented. People living in this area will take five tests, respectively on the first day, the fourth day, the seventh, the 14th day and the 21st day of quarantine. Over in Nanjing, capital of East China's Jiangsu province, cases are also on the rise, and so the city has launched its fourth round of viral diagnostic testing, be it in school playgrounds, in gymnasiums or on running tracks. It's a similar picture in Yangzhou city, where authorities have set up what looks like a checkpoint at the entrance of a compound. Here, community workers check residents' temperatures whilst others carry out COVID tests. Finally, we head over to Wuhan in central China, the city where coronavirus first emerged in late 2019. Today, a handful of locally transmitted cases have emerged among migrant workers and officials here, like elsewhere in the country, are taking no chances. The city has shut down, not a person in sight in some areas. The latest outbreak connected with the Delta variant comes after China had boasted of its success in bringing domestic cases down to virtually zero, allowing the economy to rebound. Welcome back and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. North Korea has yet to complete the necessary procedures to receive COVID-19 vaccines from the COVAX facility. A spokesperson of the UNICEF stated that they are providing technical support to the regime, but the UNICEF did not elaborate on what the steps still need to be taken. A senior U.S. official has spoken with Myanmar's exiled shadow government and also known as the National Unity Government to discuss ways to restore democracy in Myanmar. The talks were the first since the military junta ousted the democratically elected government of Aung San Suu Kyi. The British Navy said that the hijackers who boarded a vessel off the coast of UAE in the Gulf of Oman have left the ship. The news comes after the UK maritime trade operations warned of the potential hijack and the night before saying the incident is complete. The Munich to Prague express train ran through a stop signal and collided with a local commuter service in the Czech Republic, killing three people, including both train drivers. Boeing once again struck the launch of its Starliner space capsule to the International Space station due to a system glitch. And finally tonight, rare snowfall fell heavily over parts of Bolivia and Peru, blanketing buildings and leaving vehicles stranded. In Potosi, Bolivia, temperatures dripped below zero, providing the perfect climate for the downpour of snow. Some locals threw snowballs in the town square in delight, while across town a soccer match was suspended amid the rare snow conditions. In Arequipa, Peru vehicles were left stranded after snow covered the landscape, blanketing roads into a sheet of ice. The cold weather is expected to continue in Bolivia and Peru for the remainder of the week. That's all the news we have for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow with another edition of World News. I'm Suzanne Shanali. Until then, stay safe and have a good night.